Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon for those joining us in Asia. It's a great pleasure to see so many people here with us at the Global Initiative today for the launch of our paper and infographic entitled China's New Silk Road, written by one of our team, Virginia Camoli. Um, we are very excited actually to use this opportunity to launch a series of work around the Belt and Road Initiative and looking at how this enormous infrastructure project with its global reach is impacting on transnational organized crime. My name is Tuesday Ray Tano. I'm the deputy director of the Global Initiative and I'm very pleased to be here to introduce and moderate the discussion. For those of you who don't know us well, the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime is a civil society organization headquartered in Geneva. We were founded in 2013 with a mandate to promote the building blocks of a global strategy against organized crime. We have a core membership, we're a membership organization of 500 professionals whose full-time day jobs are to build up different parts and aspects of that global strategy. They represent their governments uh, in policy making positions. They're serving law enforcement or criminal justice officials. We also have independent um, research affiliations with academics, with journalists, with other members of civil society, as well as other members of the think tank and policy community. We feel strongly that the issue of organized crime is one which underpins and is deeply embedded in the growth and the evolution of the licit economy. And it is one that for too long has been siloed. It's either been siloed into the examination of specific markets, drug trafficking, cybercrime, human trafficking, or it's one that has been considered to be a criminal justice problem alone. Over the last eight years of the fact, since the founding of our organization, what we've seen more and more is actually the underworld or the illicit economy is intimately and deeply interwoven into the way that the licit economy and the upper world functions. So changes in patterns of trade, changes in the economy, changes in governance, in societal cohesion, will all impact on the opportunities presented to criminal groups and other criminal or corrupt actors to modify their own behavior and exploit new opportunities. We are obviously now having events like this after the most extraordinary year and a half in modern history. The global pandemic has contracted the global economy by several percent in different places. It has exposed new vulnerabilities. It's highlighted how delicate, I think, the, the framework of both global trade and global integration has been. We've seen airlines come to a halt, air traffic stop containers both express through with necessary goods through ports, whilst at the same time, the day-to-day -day transactions of global trade slowing to a minimum. There's been discussions from just-in-time management and how to ensure you know day-to-day -day delivery of goods and services around the world now to nearshoring and bringing supply chains closer to home. So it's in the context of this enormous shift in global trading and global economic patterns that we have a discussion now about one of the biggest and most significant investments in global trade that the world has seen in the last uh, since the turn of the millennium. The Belt and Road Initiative founded in 2013 or at least announced in 2013 by the government of China is a extraordinary and strategic visionary exercise. It started with an economic silk road followed by a maritime silk road followed by an initiative to for global energy interconnection all of which were intended to join Asia and Africa by land and sea. Now, since its founding ten, seven years later, there are 130 countries or more that have signed memorandums of understanding or similar agreements with China to participate in the Belt and Road. There isn't a single continent on earth that isn't now part of this initiative. Their BRI related developments are valued over a trillion dollars. They stretch from the North and South Poles. They even include outer space now. They're under the sea and they're in every continent. So for us as an organization who truly believe in this interconnectedness between licit and illicit, we feel that it's very important to understand how both the reshaping and the, and the investment into this level of infrastructure is impacting on the illicit economy. It's by no means our intention to say that hand in hand with the Belt and Road will go organized crime, 
but to actually ask whether or not that's the case and look for the evidence basis to see whether that's true. It is also always worth noting that in every country in the world, large scale infrastructure projects tend to offer opportunities to the corrupt. The public procurement is one of the most vulnerable to criminal and corruption, criminal capture and corruption, where predatory and nefarious individuals take the opportunity of huge public spending to exploit that for their own gain. So we think it's a valid and important question to be asking around the BRI. We certainly don't have an enormous number of answers. This is the beginning of a conversation. And for us, it's a cornerstone of a broader set of initiatives to fully understand how we protect infrastructure, both physical infrastructure and other forms of infrastructure like telecommunications or energy infrastructure from being made vulnerable or facilitating the growth of criminal networks. So as an introduction that I hope sets the scene a little bit of what we are trying to achieve, I'm very pleased to now turn over to our panelists. We have three today. Virginia Camoli, who is the lead author of the report that we're presenting. She is a research manager within our program under the Norway project that I've just discussed, um, focusing largely on Southeast Asia and Central and Eastern Africa. She joined the GI only a year ago from the International Institute for Strategic Studies in London, where she was the head of the Conflict Security and Development Program. She will first present the report, the paper, the key findings, and then we will then turn over to two invited guests, Deo Gumba, who's a research consultant with the Institute for Security Studies in Pretoria, where he focuses in a joint collaborative endeavor that we have with them called the ANAT project, which is uh, of which the goal is to enhance um, Africa's capacity to respond to organized crime. And Pei Ying Lo, who is the head of Continentalist, a data-driven editorial studio based in Singapore with a focus on Asia. We've worked very closely with the Continentalist on developing an infographic and to better visualize some of the interconnections between the BRI and illicit flows. We have very much enjoyed this partnership and we are very glad to have her here to talk through some of the analytical work the Continentalist has been doing in terms of understanding the different dynamics of the illicit and illicit economy in Asia. So with no further ado, I pass the floor to Virginia and thank you. Well, thank you very much Tuesday. I'm very happy uh, to finally be presenting this project uh, in the GI Asia Pacific Observatory. We have you know, spent several months working on this. So it's great to finally have reached this, uh, this point. Uh, as we know, endless pages have been written uh, and many, many discussions have been had around China's Belt and Road Initiative, but we still felt there was a need uh, to, to fill a gap and basically look more systematically at, to, at how the infrastructural developments that are part of the BRI could be exploited uh, for criminal purposes, and especially when it comes to trading uh, narcotics, human beings and environmental um, commodities. Uh, as you already alluded to, uh, the aim of our initiative was to identify points of convergence between BRI and existing uh, hotspots for illicit activities, but also looking at possible future ones. But it was never set out to be the ultimate study on the subject. Uh, this is a very, uh, is always evolving pictures, and rather we wanted to set the basis for a future research done by us or by, by others into other aspects of the, of the BRI that might also be exploited by criminals and also into other regions of the world. Uh, because in our work, we have focused primarily on Southeast Asia, Central and Eastern Africa, which are uh, regions uh, receiving vast for, uh, proportions of BRI investments, but also regions with very extensive illicit uh, markets. And with time and resources, we hope to expand into other regions that we have already started uh, both in-depth studies into uh, key trade and crime hubs and on uh, BRI corridors elsewhere, uh, such as the uh, China-Pakistan economic corridor in Pakistan. Uh, so whilst conducting the research, it became obvious that the uh, best way to represent points of uh, criminal vulnerability was uh, visually. And to a certain extent, we do that in the report, but, you know, it's a PDF file, it's a fairly, you know, static uh, document. Uh, and so we thought it would be much more effective to create a digital interactive map, which we will, we will now, now like to, uh, to show you. 
And, and Peyin, would you like to start sharing your screen perhaps? Uh, before I turn over to, to Payin, uh, one more thing we're mentioning in this stage, which I, uh, I doubt will take many uh, people by surprise, is that even though we have tried our best to uh, collate and triangulate information, we also need to be mindful of the fact that official comprehensive uh, information on aspects of the BRI and indeed uh, the projects that are formally part of the initiative is lacking. So that's something that we, we, we need to remember. And also we've done our best to understand and map the different trafficking routes and associated commodities, but just the nature of this issue means that these things are always in flux. So the information may alter accordingly. And so in with this uh, slightly boring, albeit I think important uh, caveat, I'll ask Peyin to demo the tool and show you how you can uh, interrogate it. And then I'll come back on screen and I'll discuss some of the key findings with you. Um, so over to you, Payin. Thanks. Thank you, Virginia. Um, and thank you everyone for being here today um, and taking time out of your morning and your afternoons to be with us. I am very, very happy to be invited to share in greater detail um, about this project that we've been working on with um, the Global Initiative in the last couple of months. It's been uh, quite an intense last couple of months and very excited to finally um, share with the public the work um, the detailed research that they've put together and with help sort of map it out um, into a tool that everyone can easily use. Um, I hope everyone can see my screen fine. Um, so um, this project has two major components, an essay that's written by Virginia um, that you can read um, at your own pace and leisure um, at this tab here. Um, but I wanted to um, dive in a little bit more into the map tool, um, which is really the core part of this project. Um, and we're very excited to share it. So um, hopping straight in. So as you can see here, um, um, the GI team has put together um, several layers of information um, that you can sort of get a glance of here in the left panel. Um, a key part of this project was really looking at the BRI crime hotspots around the world and how um, certain commodities are being sort of traded in certain areas, um, especially where there are overlaps with infrastructural developments and existing trafficking routes. So they put together a very detailed um, profile of various types of environmental sort of, um, you know, um, environmental type of materials such as ivory, pangolin, rhino horns, et cetera, um, various types of drugs as well and narcotics. Um, and this is also replicated here in different trafficking routes as well, as you can see here. Um, so the, the point of a lot of these layers is to give you um, as much as possible a granular look and control at how certain projects and trafficking routes overlap and potentially expose what vulnerabilities there may be in a certain area. So I would like to um, just turn certain labels on. So we have here, for example, under infrastructure, some of the, um, you know, for those of you who have observed the Belt and Road Initiative for a while now, these will be very familiar to you with mapped out um, where the key sort of projects of uh, Maritime Silk Road and Silk Road Economic Belt would be, and you can hover and get um, a bit of that information here. We've also mapped out where the key economic corridors will be. Um, like Virginia mentioned, there is the um, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor um, and, you know, um, many others sort of that, um, you know, cross over the whole of Asia into Europe and throughout Southeast Asia as well. So I would like to focus a little bit more um, into um, the BRI crime hotspots here that we see um, in Southeast Asia, because that's a lot, there's, there's a bit of a concentration of activity here. Um, and the good thing about this tool here um, for the BRI crime hotspots, it, you can turn on and off, um, you know, all of these um, specific categories of items and sort of really uh, zoom in and hone in um, on the specific commodities that you're monitoring or that you're looking after or you're tracking um, and you know, trying to uh, work on in the scene. Um, so for example, here we can, um, if let's say I remove it all, if I want to only look at um, how certain um, you know, wildlife commodities are being traded, I can just turn all of those on and those spots will appear on the map. And I, if I want to know if those same hotspots are you know, um, covering um, various types of drugs, for example, I can turn those labels on and they would all show up on this map. Um, these um, num numerical clusters here, we have two and three, they are just indications that 
this particular area has a concentration of multiple spots. And if you zoom in, they would break up into more specific spots. So you can really go all the way in as seen here. And here, for example, you know, to get more information, you just need to click on this hotspot and you will get a profile of what um, that is on the right hand side. Um, and this very detailed write up that has been done by the GI team um, and how certain sort of um, infrastructural projects in the region will be impacting um, this area as well. And if there are multiple commodities in the same spot, you can understand that here with these icons that we have here. And we've also listed them down here um, under commodity types, for example, rhino horn and ivory. Um, and on the left panel here, you can see a full profile of all the icon types or all the commodities that GI has been looking into um, to get an idea of um, what type of commodities they've sort of um, sought to match. So um, the BRI crime hotspots is definitely the, uh, I would say the highlight of this map tool. Um, but then another very important feature is also this very detailed um, trafficking route system that they've done. So they've put together a lot of composite material um, and we've helped them sort of map out from country to country where certain trade links or routes um, exist. And you can kind of hover over each line um, to get more information about the specific type of commodity traded. And I know it looks very busy, but you can always um, turn on, on and off the, the individual switches to just focus on the commodities that you want to look at. For example, here, ODS, or if you want to look at just timber, you want to understand how timber is being traded, um, traffic, sorry, around the world, you can look at that here as well. And this is the same for narcotics um, that is broken down into heroin, synthetic drugs, cocaine, uh, and precursors. Um, we also have put on quite a detailed amount of a, um, sorry, let me just turn this off. Uh, we've also put down quite a detailed amount of in general infrastructural project happening around the world. Um, so we have all these, um, these circles indicate um, different parts that um, have um, Chinese involvement or Chinese investments related to Belt and Road Initiative across the world. Um, and we have in the lighter shade of purple, um, railway projects as well. So you can kind of turn on multiple things and cross-reference them at the same time um, into a specific location that you're interested in. So yeah, in a nutshell, that is the tool. And then I would pass over the time back to Virginia. Well, thank you very much, uh, Payin. That was great. And the map as well as the report are uh, available uh, for everyone to access from the Global Initiative uh, website. So at the GI, we've long been concerned with the relationship between crime and economic development. And this relationship can be pretty paradoxical because on the one hand, economic development, such as development leading to improved infrastructure, can increase uh, economic activities and mobility and countries can lift their people out of poverty and hopefully build a more prosperous future. On the other hand, however, we also know that when develop, the development happens within countries where uh, governance is weak, authorities have limited regulatory capacity, and where informal and illicit economies are large, those countries also become particularly vulnerable to criminal activities. So in other words, development is good for both entrepreneurs in the illicit economy, as well as those operating in the illicit, illicit one. And it goes without saying that recipient countries find themselves in a very um, kind of difficult position of balancing receiving all the development and the investments, which are very welcome, uh, and also actually contending with the, the risk that might come along as well. And this reasoning also applies indeed to BRI related uh, projects. But what, what is BRI? Uh, as Tuesday has already alluded to, this was formally uh, announced in 2013 and is uh, China's um, flagship program for furthering international trade and uh, infrastructural development. This was established as an open arrangement with all countries uh, welcome to, to, to participate and the ge geographical scope has been expanding, uh, expanding constantly. 
with now cooperation agreements being signed with about 140 countries and at least 70 of those have already actively uh, become uh, involved in the, uh, in the initiative. So there are five major priorities, which are policy coordination, infrastructure connectivity, unimpeded trade, financial integration and people to people bonds. And the projects that come under this massive uh, undertaking are very wide ranging, although uh, they commonly focus on infrastructural development in transportation, so the building of roads, uh, railroads, ports, etc., energy development, such as you know, pipelines, the utility grids, mining, telecoms, digital networks, industrial park, urban development, tourism. So it's a very, uh, very a uh, wide uh, range of, of projects uh, that really involves, you know, developing connections between Asia, Europe and, and Africa, emulating, you know, the ancient uh, Silk Road and it's based around the six major economic corridors that, as, as Pejin uh, showed you a moment ago, you can see on, on our map. Uh, together, the overland routes are known as the Silk Road Economic Belt, but there is also a maritime component, the uh, 21st century maritime Silk Road. So the overall agenda of the BRI is not that new and is very much built on uh, the past 25 years of uh, Chinese um, uh, activities in, in, in the field of uh, infrastructural uh, development. And many, in fact, many projects predate uh, BRI have now been uh, subsumed into the BRI uh, framework. But what is unique about this is indeed the magnitude of the, uh, of the initiative. And Tuesday already gave a little flavor of this, but just to put things even more into context, uh, BRI trading routes are anticipated to reach two thirds of the world's population, two thirds. And the overall project GDP is planned to account for about one third of the world's GDP. So this is really, really massive. Uh, for completeness, I'll also say that uh, BRI has been met with both awe and some criticism. The latter usually related to concerns that my BRI might be used in the pursuit of, you know, bigger geostrategic or geopolitical goals, as well as some, as some, as some criticism around some of the conditions attached to uh, loans given to, uh, to developing countries. So not something that we want to discuss uh, in depth now, but, you know, just something to, uh, to be mindful of. So coming to our research, so in the Asian context, we have concentrated one of the key BRI economic corridors, which is the China Indochina corridor, and which overlaps with both established economic routes, but also establishing established uh, trafficking routes and transit hubs in Myanmar, Laos, Vietnam, Malaysia, and Thailand. And here we say that the key path under this corridor correspond to or expand uh, transnational trafficking routes for uh, timber, minerals, hum human trafficking victims, pangolin scales, methamphetamines, and a whole range of uh, illicit goods that you are very welcome to explore in our interactive map. On the African continent, we have, all, we have there looked at a combination of railway developments and port expansions, which are basically helping secure access uh, to trading markets for landlocked countries and also inland cities, which also often happen to be key production and trade sites for, uh, for illicit economies. Again, talking about um, uh, minerals, uh, wildlife, uh, and many other illicit uh, products. And similarly to what I've described vis-a-vis uh, -vis the China and the China corridor, BRI projects here uh, overlap with, and in some cases extend, existing trafficking routes in the eastern, southern, and central regions of uh, Africa. Uh, really, the cornerstone here are two main rail uh, corridors, basically connecting the eastern, eventually connecting the eastern uh, coast of uh, Africa uh, in, uh, and the uh, western coast. And, and Dio will talk more about some of these uh, dynamics uh, in a minute. But let me now drill down into this complex relationship between infrastructural development and crime in the BRI context. So as we said, you know, BRI related projects will bring or some of them started to bring, you know, investments, services, uh, you know, job opportunities, prosperity to countries across Asia, Africa and, and beyond. And, and the World Bank estimates that once completed, uh, BRI uh, associated, associated transport projects could increase trade between 2.7 and 9.7 percent 
uh, increase income by up to 3.4% and lift uh, some, well, nearly 8 million people from extreme poverty. But there is another side of the story because projects like the BRI, which foster inter-regional economic integration, can be facilitator of transnational organized crime in places such as Southeast Asia, where illegal trade in drug, environmental commodities and people is rife. And we indeed give in the report an overview of these different uh, criminal markets, both in Asia and the African uh, context. So the issue is not the trade integration itself, but rather the fact that law enforcement and protection are lacking and levels of corruption are often quite high. So the regional integration can be exploited for criminal purposes. As another study that GI recently uh, produced indicates, you know, illicit trade is already expanding dramatically around the world. Uh, and criminal networks are seeking even more favorable uh, pathways for illicit trade. And increased connectivity provided by the BRI might afford organized crime networks just that. Um, when, during our research, when we were looking at BRI corridors and routes and trade hubs, and we were studying them in parallel with illicit trafficking routes and hotspots, it was impossible for us really to, 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 to miss the overlaps and convergences. And there were some names that kept on popping up. So places such as uh, Yunnan province in China, and particularly its capital city of Kunming, in Cambodia, the uh, Sihanoukville, the city of Sihanoukville with its autonomous port and special economic zone. On the African continent, uh, Mombasa, which is a key railway hub and also a key maritime hub. These were, you know, recurrent uh, locations that are both important BRI uh, nodes and magnets for trafficking of various uh, illicit uh, commodities, as well as financial crime and other criminal activities. I mean, this is not surprising, you know, as I already mentioned, illicit and illicit routes often uh, coincide, and this has been happening for a long time and it predates uh, BRI. But the risk is now that criminals will see further opportunities in BRI infrastructures and, and, and the greater connectivity to reach new markets in the pursuit of uh, higher uh, revenues. Uh, this challenge is not happening in a vacuum because it's compounded by a number of vulnerabilities such as, you know, laxity, the presence of corrupt employees or officials and some key nodes, for instance, uh, you know, um, in, within ports, um, obsolete bureaucracy, or things that are quite uh, common, especially in the maritime sphere, and I'll say a bit more about that in a moment, uh, uh, in, the, in all the regions covered in our study. Uh, similarly, there are problems related to border security, which remains a concern in the countries along BRI routes, uh, also marred by uh, high levels of corruption and the fact that borders are often poorly uh, patrolled, and, 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 and there are very limited safeguards to address cross-border criminal activities. So as I've already, uh, as I've already alluded to, uh, one area where things could become more challenging is maritime shipping. And this came out quite strongly in the context of our work. So among other things, we could simply argue that the sheer volume of trade alone increased because of BRI is likely to result in easier passage for illicit goods. Just to put it bluntly, uh, larger volumes of goods simply make it harder to detect illicit shipments. And already only a very small proportion of containers that go through ports is actually um, inspected. On top of that, we also know that uh, having uh, containers uh, sitting at ports is very, very expensive. And so there are uh, financial incentives for speeding up the process, which might result in you know, people avoiding to conduct thorough inspections or just simply being unable to, to do that. And of course, on top of that, you know, you know the, the, the issue of uh, uh, bribing, you know, bribing of officials just to look the other way, something that can, is already quite commonplace uh, in a number of locations, mm -hmm. and these practices are unlikely to, um, to, to, to go away. And we could talk more about the maritime environment uh, in the Q&A if any of you is interested. Another potential uh, side effect uh, related to uh, BRI infrastructure uh, projects is the potential strengthening of Chinese criminal networks, who normally tend to be involved in and control the entire supply chain from source to distribution into the Chinese market. And this seems to be particularly common uh, in the case of illicit wildlife trade, 
with Chinese criminal actors, for instance, dealing with local poachers in Africa or across Asia for the sources of pangolin scale, bear bile, and rhino horn, rhino horn and then they're involved all the way into the, uh, along the, the supply chain. So in this respect, in particular, the greater connectivity uh, between Asia and Africa, and Africa being a key source for illicit wildlife products, for instance, is expected to increase uh, these uh, criminal, uh, criminal activities. And, uh, and, and this concern is kind of heightened by the, by, by the fact that uh, some of the, of the key hubs for illicit trade in environmental commodities in such as ports in Kenya and in Mozambique are uh, currently being um, expanded uh, under you know, BRI uh, projects. So this creates this increased connectivity between producer and consumer markets might uh, mean a greater um, or an increase in this illicit, illicit trade. Um, another risk is that criminals might, this, you know, uh, criminal networks might uh, penetrate Chinese communities established in BRI-linked countries and leverage social ties to engage or coerce uh, fellow Chinese nationals into illicit activities. And lastly, there seems to be a well-established pattern of Chinese criminal organizations becoming involved in casinos and cryptocurrencies and claiming connections to the Chinese uh, government. This specific link between this Chinese criminal networks and the BRI became even clearer when last year the US Treasury imposed uh, sanctions on uh, Wan Kuo Khoi, who is a guy who you normally refer to as a Broken Tooth, and he's a leader of the 14K triad, which is one of the lar largest uh, Chinese uh, crime organizations in the world, and is involved in drug trafficking, gam illegal gambling, racketeering, human trafficking, all sorts of, of criminal activities. What he had done, he had moved to Cambodia, he set up a chapter of a fraternal, fraternal organization, the World Hogman History and Culture Association, which, which is normally like a synonym to triads, and he tried to legitimize his, um, his triad by co-opting individuals in Cambodia and Malaysia and trying to really to build a facade of legitimacy by claiming association, association with BRI projects. And we have more examples in, in the reports that point uh, to, these, uh, to this pattern. So to conclude, and before I, I turn it over to, to Dio, will tell us more about the dynamics around in and around Mombasa. I'd just like to say it is not difficult to see why so many countries have already expressed interest and have, or, or have begun implementing BRI um, projects, given the, the prospects for growth and prosperity that are attached to this initiative. Yet, if we take into account how uh, adaptable criminals are, uh, the fact that the special economic zones that are part of BRI create an ideal environment for uh, illicit uh, activities, and also just simply the, the, the huge finance, financial incentives, uh, it is reasonable to expect the further growth of illicit trade along some BRI corridors and in some BRI-related hubs. And if we are and indeed, in this context, we are already undertaking specific studies to get a better understanding of the criminal uh, landscape in some of these key hubs. And we could even speculate further that if the combination of development on the one hand and uh, criminals exploiting economic trade and opportunities on the other uh, results in the emergence and expansion of illicit markets and economies, then this dynamic would probably often end up generating further insecurity weakening uh, governance and also negatively impacting human health and the environment. And if all these implications are taken together, they end up undermining one of BRI's own objectives, which is to encourage stability through economic development. Thank you for listening. And uh, I will turn over to uh, Tuesday. Thank you, Virginia. That was an excellent presentation and a very clear uh, an engaging way of showing some of the interconnections and some of the trends or incidents that we have seen that allow us to continue to build on this evidence basis. Um, given the vast geographic scope of the, both the BRI and of our analysis, which could span two continents, we wanted to take a deep dive into really looking at how it is an infrastructure node like a port or an airport becomes such a pivotal turning point for the illicit economy. We thought to make it a little bit more real, a little bit more concrete, 
So we asked our colleague uh, Deo Gumba from the Institute for Security Studies in the Annette program to share some of the details of his work on Mombasa port, which is, as um, Virginia mentioned in her presentation, one of the largest ports in Africa and a key hub um, in Kenya and for Eastern Africa and the Horn, uh, both for trade, transit, economic activity, and evidence of um, criminal connections. Deo, over to you, please. Thank you. Thank you, Tuesday, and um, thank you, Virginia. Um, only a drunkard would accept these terms. Uh, that is, those are words that were used by the Tanzanian president, John Pombe Magufuli, when he canceled a 10 billion loan deal. Critics who called the deal a killer Chinese loan urge Magufuli's predecessor, uh, uh, Jakaya Kikwete, not to sign. Now, the reason why I'm, uh, I'm, I'm uh, you know, referring to this uh, quote by Magufuli is uh, so that we can contrast the uh, Tanzanian experience. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about Tanzania. I'm just uh, looking at that as a way of showing um, what uh, happened in Kenya uh, as opposed to Tanzania. Um, the, in Kenya, the government decided to sign uh, Chinese infra infrastructure loans uh, uh, that, uh, you know, led to the construction of uh, the standard gauge railway, uh, which uh, if you look at the map, uh, is showing um, from point uh, three, uh, the, 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 the points that are indicated. Uh, standard gauge railway runs uh, from the point at the, at the coast where Mombasa is, um, where you, you can see, um, actually it's, it is uh, two, uh, you can see two, two, and then you can see up to three. So between uh, point two and two, uh, the standard gauge railway has been built uh, and it has been going on. And um, uh, what one interesting thing that is causing a lot of um, uh, APRO right now is uh, uh, the conditions that were laid uh, that were laid down for the construction of uh, uh, the SGR. Now I'm not going to take a lot of time on this. I, uh, my interest is to look at uh, what underlies uh, this acceptance uh, of uh, a, a, a contract that was that, that has actually led to two things. One, Kenya has ended a contract with China Railroad and Bridge Bridge Corporation to run the, uh, the, the, the standard gauge railway. Um, that, that, that happened this year. And then uh, that was after Court, Court of Appeal, uh, you know, ruled that the contract was illegally uh, awarded uh, to the China Road and Bridge Co Corporation. Um, uh, and that was in June, 2020. Now those two uh, uh, events show that uh, actually the, con the, con the contracts that were signed between Kenya uh, and China for the building of this uh, project uh, had uh, certain flaws, but why, uh, how comes that um, this was accepted and what uh, is that building to and what did uh, that lead to uh, in Kenya? Now, when you look at the Mombasa port, which is at the epicenter of this project, um, when uh, a study that uh, uh, I carried out under the NAC project, uh, showed that actually corruption among, uh, uh, you know, uh, port uh, users and, 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 and officials uh, is a, a big problem and corruption and political patronage uh, is a key vulnerability uh, to the Mombasa port uh, that uh, uh, directly affects normal business activities leading to operational and structural uh, weaknesses. Um, this is what uh, networks of, of, of uh, the criminal networks take advantage of. Uh, one of the weaknesses uh, that uh, uh, you know came out in the research uh, is that um, top management at the Kenya Ports Authority, which manages the Kenya port, uh, has a lot of weaknesses. It, it, it remains uh, uh, shipwrecked uh, in a turbulent sea of vested interests and corruption that has expended the energies of six managing directors over the last two decades. Now, 
uh, out of those, only two have been able to do more than three years in office. And you can imagine what that means uh, for the running of a, a, an important port uh, like Mombasa, which is the largest in the region. Now, um, three of, of, of these managing directors were, uh, uh, you know, were uh, unable to, con to complete uh, their, their uh, you know, terms, and they left under very controversial circumstances. And these controversial circumstances, we, we can see examples, two examples uh, that I'll, I'll mention. Three, um, uh, I'll, I'll mention the, the, the immediate former uh, managing director that, that uh, left amid a scandal, again, that involved uh, you know, uh, a Chinese company, the China Communications Construction Company. And this was a $25 million irregular tender to build an oil terminal at the Kipevu area. So when the SGR was going on, uh, there, were, uh, there was a lot of modernization also going on at the Mombasa port. And uh, this also, uh, you know, uh, kind of pulled in uh, the managing director. And we are going to see uh, very uh, briefly uh, how that happened. The second one, uh, who was the only female managing director uh, at the port, uh, this happened in uh, 2018, uh, was forced to resign after two years in office over uh, a, a controversy when she uh, actually demanded payment over an eight uh, of over 8.5 million US dollars to KPA for the use of, uh, you know, KPA labor and equipment by the Kenya Railway Corporation, the partner company that was running uh, SGR. Now, um, the high turnover uh, at the top of the of the Mombasa port uh, is um, a, a big problem for the for, for the port's uh, uh, you know sustainability. Um, and um, what is in interesting is that uh, these managing directors are merely grass that has been in, uh, been uh, trampled on uh, in a fight between titans, and the, the titans are the vested political interests. Uh, that position themselves to influence decision at the port, uh, it is this conflict of interest that increases risks and costs of illicit businesses and opens doors wide for illicit activities. Uh, uh, and, and that uh, includes uh, transnational organized crime, um, which involves you know, trafficking of uh, you know, wildlife uh, you know, products uh, actually during the time that the SGR and, and the modernization was going on, um, they, they, there were reports that, um, you know, uh, trafficking uh, had gone up uh, of, of, of wildlife uh, uh, products. And there is a lot of work that is going on to, to manage uh, that situation. Now, uh, uh, an, another, uh, an example of uh, cargo theft, uh, when you look at, um, um, when we looked at the, you know, reports of cargo theft at the port, we found out that about 500 containers had disappeared from the port. That was uh, in December uh, 2017. Now, uh, 300 containers vanished without trace and the others were found. Now, according to the KPA security department, a number of staff were arrested. And of course, uh, the courts are yet to determine the matter. Uh, you know, almost four years later. Uh, the security department also highlighted irregular release of 120, uh, 24 containers uh, from the May, uh, I mean, uh, in May 2016, leading to a $1 million uh, loss uh, in tax revenue and theft of 12 containers, uh, none of which, uh, nine of which were intercepted. Now, uh, with such a state of, a state of affairs, uh, the Mombasa uh, port uh, can only be considered to be profitable because it makes a lot of profit. Uh, this, uh, you know, has not, uh, you know, impacted on the on the profit, the problems that it has with the top management and all that. Uh, but you can see that uh, the, the the profits are because uh, the, the the port remains one of the largest uh, with connectivity to eighty ports worldwide. Uh, it is also uh, it, it has also undergone a lot of modernization, as I said. It is uh, also a monopoly uh, in the region uh, for uh, uh, import and export hub, as an import and mm -hmm. export hub for Kenyan traders, but also a transshipment hub for traders in neighboring landlocked countries. 
uh, but these uh, neighboring uh, traders from neighboring countries are slowly turning to other ports in the region, like Dar es Salaam, Djibouti, and Port Sudan. So you, you, you can see that it is having an impact on the port. Now, the profits uh, are not uh, because uh, the port is efficient. If it is efficiently run, it is a way uh, to, uh, or, or is it on its way to becoming uh, you know, a, a smart port. So uh, because of lack of efficiency and, uh, you know, uh, technical, uh, you know, uh, technological advance, advancement, uh, the decisions around that, around uh, enhancing efficiency and technological advancement have also been a problem because of the uh, political, uh, you know, the, the political uh, bickering or the, the political uh, interests, uh, conflict of interest that is going on at the port, and of course, because of the the the, the leadership that has not been able to be uh, quite uh, uh, you know uh, quite stable uh, over two decades. So uh, that has made the port prone to you know uh, arms trafficking in an area in a, in a region that has con uh, that has known a lot of conflict. Uh, I mentioned wildlife crime, uh, smuggling of illicit and counterfeit products. In fact, reports within Kenya. Uh, and and other uh, other countries in the region like Uganda, which uh, uh, you know uh, relies on the Mombasa port heavily, uh, show that uh, that there is a lot of counterfeit goods that have uh, gone to, uh, that that have hit uh, that are affecting the market, uh, and that was uh, mainly seen during the uh, the, the COVID uh, you know the, the COVID period, uh, COVID nineteen period, where uh, a lot of counterfeit. Uh, you know, uh, the, the counterfeit equipment, uh, safety equipment, and, and also uh, things like sanitizers that are used for, for the ports uh, were also, uh, you know, uh, have, have, have been, uh, um, you know, uh, brought in by uh, different, uh, you know, uh, criminal uh, networks that are, are selling this. So uh, in such a situation, uh, you can see that, uh, the BRI um, um, was, uh, you know, came and brandished uh, blank checks to drunkards, uh, if I were to use uh, Magufuli's word. And these people, uh, you know, uh, they, they, whether they were drunk or, or with power or alcohol, uh, such drunkards are unlikely to care for the repayment conditions fraught with risks uh, for countries' uh, sovereign interests. Uh, you, you safeguards against Ill, uh, you know uh, illicit uh, activities at the at the port, and uh, also uh, uh, the the risks of the commercial viability of the Mombasa port. So uh, this is just to show uh, that you know um, although uh, the, the the BRI has enabled uh, the Mombasa port to be modernized, and uh, we see uh, you know a new line of you know SGR railway. Uh, but uh, that has left Kenya with, because of corruption, with a lot a uh, big debt to pay. But also, the Mombasa port still remains, despite all the modernization and everything, uh, it still remains very vulnerable to transnational organized crime um, in the region. Thank you very much. Dio, thank you for that excellent presentation. Also, that was fascinating and a little bit sad, I must say, to see all that development potential and economic um, potency being so easily corrupted and diverted in so many ways. I thank all of our panelists who gave you very different but complementary analysis about how the illicit and the illicit are interweaving around BRI infrastructure. I would like to spend the last 10 minutes that we have of the session to open the floor to some questions. There have been a number coming up in the chat, so I will um, call on a few of them if that's okay. It is, of course, with a being very, very large meeting, quite a lot, um, <laughs> quite a lot of questions, so relatively hard to manage. If you do want the floor to ask your question yourself, um, put a hand up, but we'll start with some of the written ones. Going from the bottom a little bit, there's one question here on how the map and the analysis interacts between, or shows the interaction between migrant smuggling and human trafficking and the BRI. I don't know, Virginia or Pei Ying, if one of you could look to that. Um, we also have a question here, 
how uh, I think some of the politics behind the BRI and the funding question and whether or not we should look at this as a form of territorial colonialism, uh, economic colonialism in le lesser developed countries. Um, I also ask, there's a question also here on Myanmar specifically and whether or not that we should, and I think perhaps we could also ask this question more broadly on the question of illicit financial flows. So Virginia, whether or not we could see whether a lot of the paper focuses on the physical rather than the financial, whether or not you could comment on um, some of the financial dynamics in Myanmar in particular. So Virginia, I give the floor to you and if you want to pass over to Pei Ying at any point, please do. Of course, thank you. Thank you very much for, also for, all, the, for all the comments. Um, so, okay, so, 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 where, so where to begin? On the uh, human trafficking, human smuggling. Uh, for, so that is a very important uh, aspect that we've looked into because really uh, we can see plenty of evidence of how increased uh, ease of movement for people is actually facilitating uh, human smuggling and human trafficking in general. But also more specifically, there have been a number of, um, of reports, a number of cases that really uh, show how labor exploitation and then linked uh, illegal migration and human trafficking uh, can be increased along the BRI corridors and for people who are taken to work on some of these uh, on these projects. Uh, in addition to labor exploitation, we are also looking at issues related to prostitution and forced marriages. There have been multiple reports from across uh, Asian countries in particular within the region we are studying. So in, like in, um, in Laos or, or Myanmar, but also more broadly in Kyrgyzstan or Pakistan, where women have been uh, taken to uh, China or to other Asian countries for forced uh, marriages and also for, uh, for prostitution. And then um, that's something that we, we discuss in an, from an, in an analytical way in the report, and then people can visualize uh, on the map by uh, selecting uh, human uh, trafficking and smuggling uh, on the map. I will add a caveat there is because... Um, of course, uh, human traffic and human smuggling are two separate things, uh, are quite different. Uh, however, it's not always uh, clear from the reportings to, uh, to, to differentiate uh, between the two. And also oftentimes the, the, the border crossing that are used and the ports and, and other uh, hubs that are used are used for both. So in the maps, uh, often you'll see them uh, combined, but there is a more uh, detailed explanation uh, in the report uh, about that. Uh, with, with regards to the illicit financial flows, uh, that's something that we are uh, very much interested in, and we are in the process of, uh, well, we have already started a new piece of research that looks into uh, illicit financial flows, and also uh, along the BRI, but also uh, more, uh, more broadly, and looking at how how some key hubs uh, are being exploited for these purposes. And related to that, we are also, uh, uh, well, in, in the not so distant future, be presenting some work that looks at uh, casinos and how casinos can be conduit for uh, illicit uh, financial flows among other uh, criminal, uh, criminal activities. Uh, with regards to, uh, to, to Myanmar, uh, we don't have any immediate commentary uh, already uh, on, about the, uh, you know, the most recent uh, political unrest, but Myanmar features very uh, prominently uh, in our work. Uh, we recently published a study that looks at uh, illicit uh, timber trade between Myanmar and, and China, and we hope uh, if the situation settles in, in Myanmar to conduct a study later on in the year that looks at Mongla. Mongla is in Shan state and is a particularly interesting part of the countries and is also conduit for multiple uh, illicit, uh, illicit activities. Thank you, Virginia. I know we're throwing all kinds of questions at you. We've had another couple that are very good. Um, one to Paling, if a uh, clarification on the map which uh, you can probably see it, it's clear from the map which lines are specific geographically accurate trade routes and which are simply straight lines connecting one known trade hub to another. So if you could reflect on some of the dynamics in terms of drawing the lines on the map. And then two not unchallenging questions for you, Virginia. One on the uh, role of SEZs, so special economic zones and how they impact on criminal activity. 
and another um, on whether the BRI would lead to an increase or a decrease in maritime piracy in the Indian uh, Ocean region. Um, Payin, I'll pass to you first, maybe. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm very happy to answer that question. I think it would be extremely difficult to get um, complete geographical accuracy on um, a lot of these projects that we've mapped out, um, just because the data that's available, um, provided by different governments, um, et cetera, is um, usually very um, scant in detail. So what um, the GI team and my um, and the continentalist team have done is we've cross-referenced quite a number of different maps and public resources that we know are available um, to kind of put together the material. And so to answer your question, most of the um, infrastructural um, sort of mapping of the Belt and Road routes and the economic doors are largely approximations of where we think it would be. Um, and for the infrastructure projects, um, to that, um, for specific ports, we know where the ports are. So that as uh, using satellite sort of references in, um, on Google Maps, we roughly know where, that, where those are. And in terms of the railroads, those are also approximations because a lot of those railroads are not yet developed. So um, we cross-reference maps that have been published um, to make um, this data set happen um, in this tool. Um, for the BRA hotspots, um, we sort of know exactly which cities um, these uh, events or these sort of um, illicit trafficking activity tend to happen in. And because we know the exact cities, um, I would say there is a, date, uh, a, a great degree of geographical accuracy to the city, but it's not you know, down to that exact dot that is on the map. Um, as for the, um, uh, let me read the question. As for the trafficking routes, um, those are usually approximations, uh, approximations between countries. Um, yeah, and not so much um, specific um, cities or ports because of the data that was available. So we've done the best we can with the available data, um, but I wouldn't say that it's all of them um, are super geographically accurate just because that data is very hard to attain. Yeah. I'll try to take those questions about the special economic zones. Um, so, I mean, this is a very important aspect of the BRI, and there are about 50 special economic zones that have been planned under the BRI, which will be built over the next several years. This is not something new for China. It's been building a special economic zone since 1980, and really trying to attract uh, foreign, but also domestic investors uh, through tax incentives and uh, perhaps a more uh, uh, dynamic, um, uh, di dynamic uh, approach to, to trade by giving local authority a certain degree of independence from, social, uh, from the central government when it comes to international trade, um, uh, trade activities. Uh, they have been very uh, lucrative uh, from uh, China's uh, perspective, but they've also uh, you know, been facilitating uh, illicit trades. And these, these zones are basically, not only they are a tax, customs and tax havens, but they've also become manufacturing zones uh, and, and trade zones for all sorts of uh, illicit uh, goods, for human trafficking, um, the production of counterfeit uh, goods and medicines. So this trend is really not just the, the result of, I don't know, weak national capacity to monitor what is happening within a certain uh, special economic zones and, and to interdict the flaws, but it's, it's, it, the problem stems from the fact that, uh, that there, is, there is an agreement in place by, whereby the country waives, uh, waives their right to any kind of surveillance of what is actually happening uh, in terms of uh, commodity uh, flows and financial flows uh, with in those uh, special economic zones. Uh, there is one that we discussed often in, in the projects, and we are doing a more in-depth study of, which is uh, Sianukville uh, in, in Cambodia. And um, uh, many, many foreign companies, especially Chinese ones, uh, operate out of the Sianukville special economic zone. And the US government has accused some of these entities of exploiting um, these 
SEZs and to falsify the origins of their good and evade, uh, and evade duties. Um, but there are, of course, multiple uh, scattered across the region, and some of them also are home to uh, casinos, which, as I've already mentioned, are, are re really uh, quite, um, quite uh, problematic. Uh, there was a question on, like, another maritime question or on, on piracy, and I think that's something that uh, we have been uh, looking at. Uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, the maritime environment, the shipping environment is a vulnerable one, but the regions that we have studied are also um, have also been played by quite a widespread piracy attacks, especially in the past. And I'm thinking of the Gulf of Aden and the Somali coast when it comes to Africa and the Malacca Strait when it comes to Asia. So in recent years, there have been a decrease uh, a significant decrease of attacks, but this seems to be the result of uh, increased um, active patrols by Navy and Coast Guards, rather than a decrease in the appetite of um, uh, pirates to, to, launch, uh, to launch operations. And actually, I don't think the risk has gone away completely, because as we saw uh, at the end of 2019, there was just a, um, a sudden rise of attacks in the Singapore Straits, uh, off the coast of uh, Port, One, Port Noir in Congo Brazzaville in early 2020, again, a surge of attacks there. So this is a problem that is not going away. And you could perhaps argue that with more vessels uh, crisscrossing the seas along the Arai corridor, with corridors, it is possible that pirates will see them and think that you know these are very lucrative uh, targets and that might uh, uh, prompt a resurgence um, of, of attacks. Thank you, Thank you, Virginia. Thank you, Pele, Ian, for those two questions. I'd like to take a set of questions before we close that looks very much at what we do next. Um, Deo, I think a question that would be well positioned to you is um, how in these kind of high risk jurisdictions, how have you seen, could you suggest any responses, policy initiatives that might be effective? in a context like uh, Mombasa port, I can either speak to Mombasa specifically or a bit more broadly. And then um, questions again around responses on, um, where would you say, Virginia, what is action best targeted at addressing some of the transnational organized crime consequences that we've begun to see? Do we have any suggestions or best practices that we feel that could be applied? So I'll give the floor to Deo. And then Virginia, if you'd like to answer the final question on a look forward and wrap up for us, that would be great. Thank you, Tuesday. Um, uh, I would say, let me uh, just uh, illustrate using um, the uh, dry port storage. Um, the Mombasa port, one of the things that was done that uh, uh, at the port was to uh, actually uh, allow private companies to um, you know, have private storage around the port. And what is likely to happen with the, um, the, the policy that the government has of wanting to make the SGR work and forcing all, uh, you know, all the cargo that comes in to go to inland, uh, you know, container depots uh, in, in Nairobi, in Naivasha, at the point that was uh, number two inland and number three uh, in, in, in Kisumu uh, on the map, if you can remember. Now, those, those, those points, when such storage is moved, these are storages that have been reported to uh, facilitate, um, uh, facilitate uh, trafficking and, and smuggling uh, because of uh, the nature that, you know, they are not uh, really uh, well, well uh, inspected. Uh, by the law enforcement uh, agencies, and um, with that kind of expansion of the net, uh, of, of the, the the network and and the the facilities of the port, then uh, you know there would be need for more law enforcement. Uh, at at enact one of the things that are being done is to um, you know uh, carry out training, carry out sensitization of law enforcement uh, institutions because uh, enact is also. Uh, you know, uh, implemented by Interpol, and therefore it is easy to bring these together because uh, this is something that is likely to affect the region. It's likely to affect Kenya, Uganda, uh, D DRC, uh, all the way to South Sudan, and these are countries that are uh, brought together within uh, the cooperation of uh, 
uh, you know, police chiefs organizations that come together, uh, you know, often to discuss issues that are affecting the region. So in terms of planning, those are some of the structures that can be used to ensure that uh, there is, uh, you know, communication between law enforcement agencies in different countries within the region and also within the country to try and move a step ahead uh, of uh, the uh, you know criminal networks that may take advantage of uh, such um, infrastructure. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Dave. Virginia, sorry. Sure. Go ahead. Sure. I think I think one thing that our research you know, kind of points to is the fact that uh, the risk of criminal exploitation was never really high on the agenda of those who actually designed the BRI. And given that, you know, as I've mentioned so many times in the course of, of, of today, uh, how, you know, develop, we know that development even beyond BRI can be exploited for criminal purposes, really this calls for the urgency of, in a way, crime proofing development, you know, thinking about those risks at the outset when you start designing uh, projects. And, but when I say that, I don't simply mean, um, uh, you know, just thinking about the law enforcement side, because we, we need, you know, and I will use a cliche, but we need a kind of holistic approach. It is not just about policing borders, policing ports, and all of that, but also uh, involves, you know, working closely with the private sector, like in the shipping, for instance, working closely with uh, civil societies and be engaged in, in consultations with them to monitor what is happening on the ground, as opposed to establishing some sort of um, confrontational relation between law enforcement agencies and, and civil societies. And we, we find that, uh, you know, the involvement of, of civil societies and grassroots organization, particularly uh, important. And, and we've seen that, especially in the uh, wildlife and environmental uh, crime, uh, crime sphere. So, and also just, just to say that, you know, these and reiterate that this piece of research is intended to kind of support those uh, conversations that are happening uh, around the responses to provide some of the uh, the, the, the data and, and the analysis that can actually inform those conversations and hopefully we can more constructively think about uh, uh, next stages together. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Virginia, very much for that conclusion. I think you're absolutely right. For us, this is an ongoing body of work. It's something as a topic we are uh, looking at in multiple regions, not just uh, Africa and Asia, which has been the highlight of our presentation. There was a very early question about the Western Balkans. And we have, yes, been looking at the impacts of Western Balkans, um, sorry, Chinese funded investment in the Western Balkans through our Balkan Observatory, the Observatory for South and Eastern Europe. You're very welcome to check that out online. We have upcoming through the ENACT program, a series of briefs on infrastructure in Africa and how to crime proof those, uh, which covers energy, telecommunications, airports, seaports, and um, an overarching look at the BRI specifically in Africa. So we do encourage you, please, if this is a topic of interest to stay engaged with the GI as we go forward. You'll find all of these products on our website at www.globalinitiative.net. Um, equally, if you have follow up questions, and I'm sorry, there were a couple that we don't have time for, you're very welcome to email us or any of the presenters, and we'll be very happy to engage with anybody after the meeting. So thank you again to all who came and joined us this morning, this afternoon. Um, we will be editing together a recording of this event and it will be uh, put placed on our YouTube channel. So if there's anything you missed or you wanted to <laughs> rewatch or share, please do. And the tool and the report are also available online. My colleagues will put up a link as we close and we hope you find it interesting reading and exploring. Thank you everybody and until the next time. Bye.